Um, welcome to the beta launch of the MIT Computational Law Report, um, it, which has been about six months in coming. Um, is it the next? My name's Daza Greenwood. I'm a researcher here in the Human Dynamics Lab uh, that Sandy Pentland runs and a fellow in the Connection Science Group. And my name is Brian Wilson. I am the editor in chief for the Computational Law Report and I am a fellow in MIT Connection Science. And uh, my role for the Computational Law Report is executive producer. So why do we have an editor in chief and an executive producer? What, what is it? Is it a is it a law journal? Is it a TV show? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, the idea is that we want this to be not a stodgy academic publication, but something that takes the best of articles and rigorous academic work and also brings to it some of what we excel at here, especially in the media lab, which in fact is media, um, rich media. So podcasts, video, sort of infographics where you can explore data. And data is so much of this. <clears throat> a lot of what happens in the human dynamics group here is in fact analysis of data to gain new insights and, um, and opportunities to, um, to do things with impact socially and economically. And so too, we want to head on work in the legal context to make data available as a, as a true critical asset. So one of the, some of the ways we're doing that, which we'll talk more about in a moment, is in addition to the articles and the rich media, a data playground where these things, we these data science experiments and computational law and access to justice applications that we hear about, where people have an opportunity to upload their data set, their Python notebook or their R Studio script and allow others to see if they can reproduce those results. Um, we've got a great board of directors, including many of the titans um, in, in the area of computational law and legal informatics. And so we've been fortunate to be able to, at least in the beginning, attract a lot of good data sets and a lot of good um, applications so that we can try to catalyze this idea of reproducibility and then also allowing people to take that code and extend it. And mostly like today, we're, we are a convener. So MIT doesn't have a law school and that we believe among other things puts us in a good position to be more of almost a neutral um, forum where we can do convening with people from the law, from different law schools, from industry, from technology in order to um, catalyze and promote the sort of idea flow that is necessary uh, for, this, for the profession to evolve. Indeed, and, and, and I think to that end, uh, the, the kind of program that we've set out to uh, run through today reflects a little bit about um, the kind of goals that we have in reimagining and re-engineering law as computational systems in the different types of forms that Daz was talking about. So here in just a second, we'll have Sandy come up and say a few words, and then we'll do kind of a run through of what the computational law report is in a little bit more detail with a few people coming up and providing their personal insights about that. And then we'll get into advisory and editorial board introductions so that you can hear about all the great people that we've been able to convene as a kind of mechanism for affecting this sort of change from a paper-based legal operating system to one that's more data-driven. And then we'll have a bit of a break and then we'll go into the author and invited flash talks where the contributors to the first release of this publication will have a chance to say, uh, to, to talk about the work that they've been doing in about five minutes, get a little bit of feedback, and then move on to the next one. And then we'll look ahead to the future releases of what we're trying to accomplish and talk about some of the open issues that are on our mind as we've gone through this process of setting up something that's <laughs> a little bit new and a little bit crazy in terms of, uh, legal academia, so. So, um, so uh, Brian just promised you some Sandy Pentland, and we're gonna deliver on that promise. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So, so they wanted me to talk, so I'll talk a little bit. 
Okay. So uh, you might say, why is uh, computation, first of all, why computational law? And, and certainly why at MIT? So the history is, is that when we uh, set up the media lab, one of the cool things was there was no education department at MIT. The computer science department did not do user interface, period. It was wimpy, right? <laughs> Which meant that all of that was intellectually free. Right, you know, it's like you could do stuff, and there was nobody. The dean or the president would not call you in and say, "No, you need to work with," you know, because there was nobody else to work with, right? So, so we have freedom uh, in a way that other people don't. So that's actually pretty good. Um, why computational law? Well, uh, I'll say something that uh, um, he reacted to. He says this caused you to like pause, right? Which is that law is just algorithms. That's all it is, right? Now, some of the algorithms have steps in it, like talk to a group of 12 people and decide if they're guilty or something like that, right? Uh, so they have, they're not just computer algorithms, it's algorithms for people and, and decisions and things like that. And, um, I'd be willing to defend that, right? Uh, as a as a, a reasonable discussion, you might have to stretch the notion of algorithm a little bit. Um, and of course, what's happening is all these elements uh, in law that had nodes that were, you know, now send a person to do this are becoming now ask the computer, this, right? And so, so there's a lot of uh, uh, things becoming automatic, and um, so it's interesting to, to explore that whole idea, law as code, code as law, that sort of notion uh, from, from that Lessig popularized. But I think there's more profound things, which is as you think about this as a set of rules, as an operating system for society, that type of sort of thing, you think, well, wow, what are other things that are operating systems for society? And you know we have things like traffic systems and delivery systems and financial systems, and and increasingly these are all digital, all controlled in an automatic, responsive way. Um, and you know you have the problem of how do you keep people in the loop so it's doing the right thing? How do you keep it ru from running off the the rails? And um, there has grown up in the design of this stuff, completely independent from law a set of design practices that are uh, done around the world in every mode that you want, in air traffic and land traffic, such, which is essentially an iterative design approach where what you do is you analyze the problem beforehand, statistics, okay, that sounds sort of familiar, but then you do uh, small beta experiments with real people to see how it works and that's a very new thing in, in the creation of law. Typically, law is hard enough to create that you do it for the whole country and for eternity, and, and that's the way it works. It isn't thought of as an experimental um, uh, regime. And you get to see a little of that. Like, for instance, the, the JPAL lab here just got the Nobel Prize. Uh, we're basically saying, well, what happens if we change our social support system just a little bit? Let's do an A-B test. That's a, actually a very simple sort of idea, but, but the fact that they got a Nobel Prize for that, John is over there. <laughs> the fact that they got a Nobel Prize for that uh, sort of tells you that a lot of people don't think about this stuff as being susceptible to experiment, and it is anything with people susceptible to experiment. Sometimes there are ethics problems, right? Because, you know, if you don't do it, then people die or something like that, but experimental. And so, so all these systems start with small experiments, scale, they're considered as being unfinished. That's another sort of big difference is, is that it's not seen as the truth or the system, it's seen as version 0 0.1 or that sort of thing. So it's seen as something that's in progress. Wabi-sabi if you were Japanese. Um, and, and that's another sort of just attitudinal difference. But what it means is that you recognize that the system you've put out together, the algorithms, 
um, are going to be refined constantly. And that that refinement should be based on evidence, in other words, continuous experiment, a continuous instrumentation. And we certainly don't do that. So people put, for instance, broken windows in place in New York. Oh, wonderful, but nobody actually looked at whether it worked until like 10 years later when the cracks were really pretty evident. Same thing with opioids, right? I mean, the, the death rate from opioids goes back 20 odd years. Um, nobody really noticed it until the suicide rate, for instance, among middle-aged people from things like, and opioids is just part of it, but this whole sort of uh, disaster where life expectancy decreased in the United States for the first time ever in the last 20 years. Nobody noticed. <laughs> Funny, right? <laughs> We, when, when the Soviet Union broke up, we knew that about them, but we didn't like look at ourselves. So there's this notion of how can you design a system that's modular and instrumented so that you can update it continuously. Good examples of how not to do law are our healthcare system or our tax system, where you simply can't change anything because it's all connected, right? So people learned in, in computer science, that's called spaghetti code. Right? You know, you change this line and suddenly things all over the whole thing change. So we need to sort of bring those sort of design practices to law is a suggestion. Obviously, this is, this is way above my pay grade, but, you know, my job is to, uh, to ask the inconvenient question and throw, you know, sand in the gears and stuff like that. So that's sort of my motivation is that the things that we look at, which is how does technology change society, repeatedly bump into law. Law is often the boundary condition that determines it. It's the implementation of ideas, of course, and so forth, along with computers and everything else. Um, and, and so I think that we need to explore to what extent we can uh, integrate this more sort of design orientation and continuous evaluation orientation that we see in some areas into the, the practice of legal creation and law. Um, and I don't want to like go on about it, but you know, that's, that's my thing, okay? Irving. Start again, real quick. Previously soft discipline, apply the word plot computational. And it's the same kind of scientific method we've been applying to hard disciplines. It's the same pattern of thought. It's the pattern that you need to use um, measurement, which produces data to evaluate hypotheses about what's going on, to right. be able to build better theories. And in the sense of engineering, then to be able to use those theories to design things that are then tested and renovated and, and, and so Remember, on. to make you develop models, to make predictions. If the predictions empirically work, you have a good model. If the predictions don't work, you need to keep up. Exactly, yeah. But not all, all of what we're saying is a few hundred years old. What is really new and revolutionary, which you've been saying, is because we now have so much data about the behavior of people, organizations, et cetera, we can look at them quite different. So we use the term computational, but it's really, at the heart of it is, apply the tried and true scientific method. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. Jonathan, did you want to say, yeah? And get your exercise, Daza. So, Unlike 
the beauty you all have in the traditional, you know, in software computational fields. Law and society have been entrenched for hundreds, thousands of plus years. So we, yes. and lawyers are painfully, you know, they got to come kicking and screaming into the revolution. We are working at best with a brown field, not a green field. So how, <laughs> how okay. it would be great if we could start from scratch to, you know, use distributed ledger, use automation, yeah, yeah. use AI to recreate society from scratch in a better model. You know, you look at uh, telecommunications networks, we're stuck with 10 digit dialing and copper. If we could have started from scratch, we would not have submitted to 10 digit dialing, we would not have submitted to copper, we'd have all fiber networks, all wireless, we would, but, 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 but we were stuck with sort of adaptation. Absolutely. To existing networks. How do we create an automated legal societal framework when we've got thousands of years of crap and baggage and people unwilling to come to the revolution? Well, uh how do you so so let me let me give two examples okay um so um about 25 years ago i was uh put as one of the directors of nissan's advanced driving institute and we designed i designed actually the framework for their autonomous vehicle which is now the largest deployed autonomous vehicle system in the world Unlike Google, we sort of began building these things and trying them out on people. And we realized that there was no way to avoid the liability question, right? If you have an autonomous vehicle and you switch to a human, there's a several second delay during which you die, right? <laughs> if you have a complicated situation, the autonomous vehicle is going to run over the cute little kid and regardless of what the law says, the jury will find you guilty, et cetera, et cetera. What was missing, right, was not just the sort of legal system or the technology, but you have to have some generalized sense of informed consent from the population. The population has to understand that these are the rules. These cars do this, not that. So an example is if you walk, if a kid, cute little kid walks in front of a railroad train and gets killed, it's the kid's fault. If your cute little kid runs in front of an autonomous vehicle, it's the vehicle manufacturers. Why? Because everybody knows you don't stand on a train track, but not everybody knows that about cars. So there is, it's more than just law, it's more than just the technology, it's, it's this whole sort of educational thing. So, if you look at that whole system, well, what are we going to do? Well, we live, for better or for worse, at a time when there's a great deal of disruption. And uh, we suddenly have data everywhere, and people are running around, oh my god, you know, there's data everywhere. And, and there's uh, uh, algorithms going into law, and oh, the algorithms are our robot overlords. Everyone's very upset about all this. All the, and it's this, you know, never waste a good crisis, okay? We got a crisis, let's do it, <laughs> okay? And, you know, so what I see is I see um, <clears throat> very senior people talking about this sort of issue and how we can redo it, right? And um, they're looking for guidance, they're looking for that sort of clean concept of what it is the world should do that they can then sell. So I, so I was at this amusing club uh, weekend before last. So this is a club, it's called the Club of Madrid. Um, so when you're the president of a country and you, you step down, you join this club. So there's like 120 ex-presidents and premiers in this club. It's like, this is the social network you die for, right? And, and I got to visit with them and dance and sing and stuff like that because, um, they're concerned about what will the new social contract look like? How will we actually do this? So in their mind, there is a crisis. They see this in the operational people, the people who are currently in office, and they're looking for something that's gonna change. Well, it's our opportunity to provide them with that concept. Um, and actually, maybe I'll share something that uh, Juan back there, Juan, wave your hand. There, yeah, so, so, so uh, sort of a major voice in Vietnam and works with Michael Dukakis and uh, helps support this club. 
uh, of, of ex-presidents and stuff. Um, so we're trying to put together a statement about what the new social contract will look like, right? And, and put it in front of them. And the UN is gonna have a whole session about this next year at UN week. And you know, so it's a time to bring it up. And uh, it's not gonna be easy, right? It's gotta go with the existing stuff. But uh, I think there's opportunities to do things. Because, um, because you know, you've got a crisis, you can make the, hopefully that answers you. Yeah. And that's how I think about it anyhow. Yeah, I, I'm sorry for commenting again, but remember we can ask the same question about how did we become convinced that the earth rotates around the sun? And let's not forget that a huge part of what made the scientific revolution, the scientific revolution, is that before, if you saw the sun coming up and whatever, you said, well, clearly the sun rotates around the earth. And then Galileo and others started doing observations, started doing experiments, started doing predictions. They were almost burned at the stake by the church. But getting all that analysis, models, et cetera, is what changed people's mind. And that happened over and over again in discipline after discipline after discipline. I think what's happened is that is now catching up with the previously soft disciplines because of our tools, sure, our data, sure. but it's, it, it's the evolution of history. So, so, so an example of something like this is, is that tax law is a good example. So all the governments in the world are going, oh my God, we don't have enough money. There's all this non-compliance. Could we do something with the implementation of tax law, like make it computational and evidence-based that resulted in a better tax system? So short-term interest for long-term change. Okay, so the World Bank's interested. We're working with EY on this, uh, who's the world's largest law firm, uh, I think, <laughs> at least as they say that sometimes, because everybody's a lawyer in EY, right? It's all tax law. Um, <clears throat> That's just one example. There's a number of things where the short-term and the long-term interests are aligned. Not everywhere. Companies like, like you, right? You represent a big law firm, right? People are very interested, you do, you're EY, right? Um, people are very interested in, in changing the, the financial structure, right? And they wanna do that by changing the nature of law and law creation and regulation creation and compliance checking and things like that, just to make money for next quarter. But to do that, you know, they need to standardize contracts and make them Ricardian and do all these other sort of things that, that, that make it interesting to us, right? Tax changes in America, the tax changes in America, for example. Yeah. It's always, at this point, at least in the near term future, there is no one really speaking to help the disenfranchised in the process and all the tax cuts when you scratch the surface in order to the benefit of the most. And so, so the good point and, and the, the answer about that would be, I think what Irving said is, is that um, the current data resources about that are cloudy, right? So the OECD says one thing, if you do uh, transfer payments in there, you get a different result. What's happening really, uh, you know, we should be, that, that's this process of sort of science reflected on ourselves, right? And that doesn't happen very well today, right? So this sort of more data driven policy where you use fairly clear data is a dream. It's not a reality. Um, but part of that also means that it needs to be driven by the needs of policy and law to answer questions, to set things correctly. And, and it's not the reflex that people say, well, we need to actually have a clear answer. Okay. I mean, I, let me give you, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. Let me give you an example. Um, recently, a fellow I know named Raj Chetty tricked the IRS into linking data across generations, right? He did this by offering to build a system for them for zero cost 
And because lowest bidder has to be accepted, he got it, okay? And, but what he got was the ability to link these things, okay? And ask questions like, what social policies, what social conditions result in intergenerational mobility? It turns out there's a fairly clear answer to that, that if we had known that 50 years ago, we'd have a very different society. So we have the data, but we don't have the reflex of looking at the data. And this data, incidentally, is like everybody in the United States that files a tax form. I mean, it's just, it's incredible, right? Um, and maybe it wouldn't resolve it. Maybe people would talk about other sorts of things, but it's, it's incredible insights because it, it's data about everybody. It's not a sample. It's not an experiment. It's not a policy paper. It's every tax return of every human in the whole United States for the last 30, 40 years, right? And their children. Okay, that sounds like good data to use, but he had to go through this thing. Several people at the IRS got fired. <laughs> okay, you know, and I don't see policy people paying sufficient attention to it, right? It really is sort of the gold standard out there because it's complete and it's the government's data. It's the best you're likely to do, at least, you know, I, mean, I could imagine better, but, you know. So one of the okay. things- Okay, anyway, about, uh, oh, not so talking quick, too Sandy. much too. Oh, on, one more, one more um, reflection. Um, just st stitching together the comments. One of the things that you've talked about over the years that in large part led to the launch of this journal in terms of your vision of computational law is if the law were more, we'll say computational, but let's say data-driven, model-based, in a sense, science, um, you could have laws, tax law and others that were written in a way that could be adaptive and data-driven so that after they're enacted, instead of, you know, kind of, washing our hands of it until years and years later when it's amended again, we could actually look at how they're performing. We could measure the performance and that could perhaps adjust parameters. So that's again, this sort of iterative continuous design. Nobody in the world that builds like airplanes or transportation or delivery systems builds a system and then walks away and not look at it. It's all heavily instrumented and it's modular so that you can change the things that aren't working and you can update it because otherwise the world changes too fast, right? You need to do that. And we need to do that with government, right? And, and with interpretation of law also, I think. Yeah, but, but, but that's like hundreds of thousands of years. <laughs> and the, the, the selection adaptation function is a little violent and, uh, and unfriendly, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. I don't want to talk too much, unless you have something that you have to say. an alumni, so. I know, I know. Hello, Sandy. Uh, my name is, is Chris on? My name is Brendan Marr. I'm an alum from uh, 98. And as Sandy, and as I've said, this has been 30 years in the making, really. And what is happening, I think, to answer Jonathan's question is that we're actually starting at a very different place. So to give an analogy, we tend to think of computation as being very linear, right? Code is uh, put in very logical statements. But what's happening is we're entering into a vastly different way in terms of the way information is computed. Our smart contracts, all of the emerging distributed and autonomous systems and the distributed and autonomous uh, DAOs that are happening, the decentralized systems, we're starting at a different place. There is going to be a vast amount of complexity very, very rapidly because all of these smart contracts are going to come into play. And this is going to provide a much greater and different way of doing analysis. So, so Dynamics. Let me, let me restate that. So this is something we talked about yesterday is that the costs of doing transactions, of, of, of organizing things is dropping dramatically. So previously you couldn't make, for instance, things that were really personalized and individual. You had to make general rules that are applied in a fairly a blind way. And of course, that's not optimal because there's always special cases and context. 
And now what you're able to do is you're able to do things uh, in a much more fine grain way, a much more transparent way than as ever before. For instance, uh, we came up with a way of evaluating the country of Colombia's uh, uh, social programs and auditing them uh, in a way where you could compare what actually happens to what they, uh, a gold standard that they very expensively compute. And we discovered that, you know, they give benefits to almost a million people that they shouldn't be doing, and they don't give benefits to another million people that should be getting benefits. Well, that's, that's crazy. And, and, and the reason they couldn't do that was is that they had this uniform law it was paper-based, it was completely uh, non-integrated, so every office followed the rules or not, and you know there was a paper record of stuff, but uh, they had no way of really knowing what it was doing and no way of adapting. So you can now begin having things that are much more fair, that was the goal of this, um, and, and that's actually what they're implementing with help from the Inter-American Development Bank. So, so that's a simple example, but you know, it's the lives of 2 million people in a country of uh, six, uh, 40 million. So, you know, it probably matters. Okay, I'm gonna be quiet. I am not running this, okay? I, I am letting you guys run it. You know, the right people to run this really are people like Jonathan and you and Daza and Brian, and, and I'm just like the guy says, this is a good thing to do, okay? Right. That's what the North Star looks like. <laughs> um, thanks, Sandy. Date, so as we were just discussing, the, the data-driven model-based algorithmic service types that have transformed other professions and industries. So think like banking and finance, for example. Um, think, you know, from biplane to aerospace. Um, they're pulling the law, lawyers, and legal processes toward the same revolutionary transformation. So um, yesterday we were talking a little bit about um, what people were asking, what does it mean computational? Is this the digitization of law? Is it the digital revolution? So this slide represents a, something that we can distinguish. So um, we had paper, and what, a lot of what happened in the, well, the 80s and the 90s and still happening. What do you think? Yes, show of hands. Is it digital? It is digital. I mean, it's certainly digital, you know, it, can, it goes into a computer, but is it computational? Not really. Um, you know, it's, I would consider it more of a blob, a binary large object. Um, and so what, you know, to distinguish that, um, what we're really talking about, and we'll break it down a little bit more, especially as, as more of a speak from our perspectives, is something that's composed of data that is accessible. So if the individual clauses of a contract or a regulation or a statute for example, or a, or a complex financial legal instrument were themselves um, marked up in a format that was an open format like UTF-8 encoded plain text. If it was structured data like in JSON as JSON objects so that you could tell this is clause 172 and it relates to indemnification between these entities, that would be computational. Now we have the fuel necessary to programmatically address the terms. So we can do some simple reasoning, we can do, or even complex reasoning, we can do some um, analysis, we can do much better, more um, fine-tuned automation. Um, we could compute the law. Which brings us to one of these big questions along the lines of uh, what I think, in a sense, Jonathan and, and others were, where everyone has been talking about, which is, well, how do we re-engineer law? In the early days when people were talking about flying, um, many people thought, well, what we need to do is model like a bird. Birds fly, so we should come up with a machine that like has wings that flap, right? And I don't know if any of you have seen those hilarious and tragic 
the ending usually videos of uh, the contraptions with things that you know have wings and jump off the hill or the cliff. Well, that's not always what we need. Uh, when it's time to cause something to be computational, you know, there's some artifacts and um, assumptions that may be worked in paper um, and for paper paradigms that need to be, uh, the word I would use from um, computer science is refactored as part of the re-engineering. So it turned out if we wanted aerodynamics, fixed wing aircraft and, you know, initially biplanes were, were the way to go for the aerodynamics. Um, so too with the law, we're part of the process of taking each part of law and each kind of variant of legal process and different types of legal rules are gonna require some rethinking. Some of them can be described programmatically and very declaratively in something like Haskell. Other stuff may require something more, a little more fuzzy and AI based. So what does this shift toward computational law look like? Well, as I just said, from paper documents to um, paper documents and Word documents to something more like Markdown and JSON. So imagine going from PDF just at the simplest level to Excel, but is Excel where we want to be? Well, not really. We, we favor formats that are more like JSON or at worst XML um, so that we have structured data that can be, um, that can show up as, as part of an input to, um, to software. Um, from natural language to formal programming language. So there's a a good example is uh, who's, who here has heard of something called Lexon? Uh, you know, a handful of people. It's this very interesting innovation coming out of Berlin from a friend of ours named uh, Henning. Um, and he has this um, sort of dual um, editor on the left side. You write simple, natural language, just like normal human language uh, clauses, like for a contract or other legal instruments. Um, he has a nice demo now for a UCC9 um, security filing when you're when you have um, collateral for a loan um, and those simple phrases um, on the right side will show you um, kind of in real time what the um, software code would be and he's got a uh, I guess I'd call it a transcoder or something a transpiler uh, to um, solidity and also to Sophia. Um, and we're working with them now to also um, basically transform and compile that down to, uh, to JavaScript. So it'll be more the lingua franca of the web. And, and so to one of the things that Sandy had said earlier about law being like a legal algorithm or just an algorithm, I think, uh, you know, when you're in law school, you learn this very formulaic approach to breaking down a problem you state the issue, you state the rule that applies to that issue, you apply that rule to the issue, and then you conclude with like a pretty dogmatic statement of why you're right. Um, now, what we're seeing with computational law is you can actually structure things as data, you can input them into a certain format, you can apply a layer of computational law, and you can generate some sort of output. Um, so this is happening already with TurboTax. So TurboTax has a lot of data about tax filings, for example. A user inputs that information into some sort of standardized form. This layer of computation is applied and an expert system helps calculate these tax liabilities. And the output of that is your state and federal tax returns are generated. Um, do not pay. So the, the app that lets you sue corporations fairly easily has a lot of data about how to do that. Um, you can input your information about the different services or different products that you've purchased into their system. They automatically compute the amount of money that you can sue for. And then those claims are automatically generated. Um, DLA Piper has a global data protection laws map um, that does something similar and allows you to compare the privacy laws between different, um, different uh, international jurisdictions. And Relativity Trace has a tool that monitors emails to effectively evaluate whether or not there's a risk of insider trading about to occur. And so with that, I think we're going to hand it over to the panel that we assembled. Yes. Everybody Great, thanks. Uh, Bob, uh, can you introduce yourself and, and sort of start us off with um, computational law and this new endeavor from your perspective, and then we'll go right down the line. 
on. Okay. You so, why don't you try this one for us? How's this? All right. Um, my name is Bob Craig. I am the, currently the CIO with law firm Baker Hostetler. We have um, approximately a thousand lawyers spread across the U.S. Um, I like to always say I'm not a lawyer, but I have observed them interacting with technology now for more than 30 years. So I've been toiling in that brown field now for 30 years, Jonathan. Um, but I do think we're on the, uh, on the precipice of a new opportunity. And I think one of the observations I'll make is the fact that market forces are in play that uh, I think arguably have the global legal ecosystem uh, on unsteady footing. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, and that's happened for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, I won't lament them all, but a lot of them have to do with the increasing sophistication of the buy side of the whole equation. Uh, our corporate clients have gotten increasingly sophisticated with the application of their own technologies and their own understanding of what, what value we deliver with our legal services. That alone is a force that has gotten acute attention uh, amongst every global law firm, trying to figure out uh, how our clients think about our value proposition and the degree to which sophisticated technologies need to be employed to validate that value proposition. And so the whole industry is in a state of, um, I don't know, somewhere between disruption and awakening uh, that there's a new uh, way to think about how we have to practice law in order to continue to, uh, to get interesting work and to do all the right things for our important clients. Um, I've also observed, especially recently, uh, now with so much access to so much information, including through various forms of social media, which obviously has its downsides, but the upside is you can start to see uh, who in our industry has passion and conviction around some of these new ideas. Um, some of them are in this room, two of them are right here for sure. And, and that's coming from uh, the, the tech providers in our industry who provide solutions. Uh, I think most refreshingly, it's starting to come from uh, some really innovative law schools uh, who are trying to reorient the thinking of young lawyers. Uh, the, the human uh, barriers, which uh, of course make up that brownfield that Jonathan referred to, I really like that obviously. Um, that is the ultimate challenge. And so the question in my mind is, is there a new way to kind of catalyze that energy and passion from various sectors of the legal industry, um, put some more science, re you know where I'm going with this, Sandy teed this up very, very well. I think the, um, the participation of MIT in this whole conversation is so fascinating to me, almost therapeutic to me. Uh, in terms of giving me hope for the future. Um, and I do think as, as different, um, different ideas start to emerge and have impact, and those ideas are validated by uh, these increasingly sophisticated corporate buyers, that will start to create an energy and a momentum uh, that the, the best law firms in the world the best lawyers in the world will be drawn to that, to not want to miss that wave, uh, to be able to play a part in this new way of uh, what I like to refer to as legal engineering and being part of uh, the very design of new systems, uh, even if they're social systems, uh, certainly any system that, as Sandy put, collides with law. Um, I think I've, the lawyers I have observed um, once they see that becoming a real and present opportunity, uh, them applying their intellect and, uh, and being willing to innovate uh, will be something they, they uh, get on board with. I could go on, but um, I think that's where I'll leave it. Thanks, Bob. And um, Brian, um, I want to thank uh, Brian and Thomson Reuters Labs for um, or we should all thank them for the coffee and, and, and for being a supporting organization for this event. Thanks very much. Well, you're very welcome. Uh, 
Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Brian Ulysny. I'm the VP of Thomson Reuters Labs Americas. And we're very excited to be supporting this new uh, report. And uh, we've been working with DAZA for quite a few years and Brian and a lot of the people involved here. And it's really exciting to get this um, not only visible within you know, the confines of MIT and so on, but uh, to the wider world. So we're very excited about that. Um, at the labs where I come from, we're super excited about the potential that uh, we now see in being able to leverage the huge amounts of legal data, uh, you know, the, corp the whole corpus of, of legal judgments and so on that, that we have at, at TR, the legal citation graph, we're seeing lots of interesting stuff going on with um, uh, reasoning about um, overrulings and, uh, you know, split court overrulings and so on. Uh, uh, on top of that citation graph and so on. And uh, the, the potentials for deep learning it, within the legal space are, are kind of incredible. So one of the things that we've been doing within our lab, for example, is uh, taking, so we have a, a service called CourtWire that maybe some of you are familiar with, that um, uh, we take civil complaints as they're filed uh, before they're docketed and uh, typically we either retrieve them electronically or send runners to the court. Someone scans these things, sends them to uh, contractors. They summarize what the uh, allegations of the case are and what the damages that are being sought. Those get sent out as quickly as possible for uh, legal business development and, and financial people are interested in who's being sued. Um, and uh, so, you know, we, we, we summarize those as quickly as possible. That's always been done by humans. Um, what we have shown recently is that some of these deep learning summarization techniques can summarize these cases uh, as well as humans. So when we do double blind evaluations, um, trained legal editors can't distinguish the human generated um, summaries from the machine generated summaries. These summaries can include um, terms that they've never seen before so terms that were never in the training vocabulary can appear in the summary. They're more grammatical than the human generated summaries. And they are uh, judged to be excellent summaries more frequently than the human generated summaries. So this is pretty incredible that this, this um, task that we previously thought only, not only humans, but especially trained humans could do within the context of the law can now be done equally well by machines, which means that that, you know, so um, being able to say what a legal case is about and why it matters uh, in language that is not just language that's extracted from the legal case, but is sort of abstractively generated uh, on the basis of, of language models. Um, that means that that can, we can, uh, the summaries could be done in ordinary English, not just legalese. They could be done in some sort of computational language. They could be done in a foreign language, as long as there's the, the training data to do this. And so I think we're on the, uh, the verge of seeing a lot of really interesting um, opportunities for machines to expand you know, access to uh, legal services and so on in ways that we've never seen before. And so we're really excited to be part of this, um, this journey that's gonna be documented and, and uh, explored within the context of this report. And um, super excited to be here at the beginning. Thanks. You know, it's almost to do summaries of dense, complex legal um, corp corpora um, along the lines of Brian. So you, it's almost as though you'd need a a PhD in computational linguistics from MIT to deal with that. That's exactly what Brian has. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and so what we are really seeking to do with our partners and with our research affiliates here at MIT is bring the best of computational thinking like a laser onto the law so we can, we can get there. And, uh, and that's, thank you, Brian. And we have a lot of Brian's here. So to distinguish us, this is cool, Brian, in case you wanna get his attention. <laughs> um, oh, thanks. Yes. I just I want to take one one other moment to announce that um, 
uh, we are sponsoring a, um, uh, an internship in computational law this summer. It's a memorial internship uh, named in honor of Andreas Antonio, the uh, CIO of Paul Weiss, long-term um, CIO of Paul Weiss, who was tragically killed this past summer in an accident. Uh, so we're, we're offering an internship uh, this coming summer for undergrads or law students who are interested in exploring the frontiers of computational law with us. So hopefully uh, someone here knows someone who might be interested, so please get in touch. Thanks. And we've had a great uh, relationship over years, uh, Thompson Reuters Labs, with our um, MIT undergraduates going there, and that's been one of the great ways we've connected. So in the spirit of excellence uh, in different fields, we're also really thrilled that Cat Moon is on our team. And one of the big questions, I think, for all of us, and that Sandy's been posing for years as well as, you know, you've got these deep computational systems that are very numbers-based. What, what would be the interface? What would be the human experience that a legislator could um, interact with in order to create rules that are computational, that lawyers could interact with, that business people would interact with? Uh, what is the design of that? And so that's really why we wanted to recruit Cat Moon to be, to be on our team and why we're so excited that you're with us today. So Cat Moon. Thank you, um, Daza. So I'm Kat Moon. I teach at Vanderbilt University Law School. I'm the Director of Innovation Design, and I also teach um, a few technology-related courses. My passion and really where the intersection of my thought and effort is um, the intersection of technology and how we humans consume technology and use it. Um, I'm going to pull a quote out from Sandy, and then I'm going to use it out of context, but I think the statement, um, <laughs> um, I haven't tweeted it yet, but that might happen. Uh, you know, Sandy made the statement, more than law, more than technology, it's about education. And so um, I think that this report is a phenomenal opportunity to create access and help create understanding um, and really build a community around um, really this very sophisticated work that's happening in a lot of pockets globally. Um, I have conversations with people around the world and it really, um, the connections that are being built, I think are phenomenal, but we need to supercharge those connections and really create a nexus point so people have a place where they can come around these ideas and have really interesting conversation and share and build community, but equally so, and this is why I'm really interested in, in um, the format reflecting the sophistication and nuance of the content, is that the format is really going to be agile and it's going to take different forms. And so the content is not going to be delivered solely in the form of frankly, a very dry academic paper. Um, I know some people enjoy reading through those, um, but it really limits access to very important thought ideas and information when that is the only way these things are shared. And so to create content in much more accessible and to many people much more interesting and understandable ways, I think is really going to expand the ability of the people involved to share these important ideas and build on them and create a community around them. Um, I think it's critical that we address how we are going to take all of this very complex information and these very important yet complex and sophisticated ideas and translate them in a way so that we are actually educating people who need to understand these things, people who need to be able to use this information, people who create policy, people who create our laws. Um, this is not merely an academic conversation. It has very important real world com consequences. And so that design, that interface about how we translate it and share and create understanding, I think is critical. And so that's why I jumped on board because I'm excited. I think it's going to do some new things in some new ways and I'm very excited to be involved. Thank you. Um, my name is Diana. I'm 
Pra coming from Lisbon. I'm initially a loss. I did law, law and management. Actually, I'm doing engineering and public policy, so huge shift, and work as a fellow as well with with engineers most of the times. But it's quite interesting to help and have both sides in in this experiment. So, hi everyone. Oh. I'm, I'm as an editor. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Robert Mahari. Uh, I'm at the Harvard Law School, but I'm an MIT alum. Um, I studied chemical engineering here. Um, and I'm kind of pushing from the student side and from the education side. Uh, I run the Harvard Law and Technology Society there. Um, we're very proud to have put together uh, probably the largest kind of student-run legal tech event uh, in September. Um, and we're, we're kind of pushing for, for faculty members, for our fellow students to realize the changes that are happening and how they can get involved um, and kind of design and hack the law. Um, so, so that's my function. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Renieris. Um, I'm the founder of a consultancy called The Hacky Lawyer, which is focused on a service called Legal Engineering, uh, which you heard a little bit about earlier this morning. Um, I'm also a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, um, so just down the river. Um, I'm focused on basically designing and building better legal frameworks around our data. Um, I've been in-house at a number of um, emerging tech startups, and so um, I have a very technical perspective as a lawyer, um, and I'm really looking to bridge the gap between lawyers and technologists. Um, I am serving on the advisory board, both potentially, uh, to be determined. Uh, I've been working with uh, Daz and Brian and others here for a while, so I'm looking forward to it. I'm Jonathan Askin. I'm a professor at Brooklyn Law School, and I guess I stumbled into legal tech through circuitous paths and being driven out of other fields. I started as a civil rights, civil liberties lawyer and realized unless I started to understand technology, I was never going to be an effective attorney in the digital age. So I moved into tech law. And then I think people conflated the term tech law with legal tech. So I, by default, became a legal tech academic as opposed to just a straight tech, law, academic, and here I am now. And I am also, a, no, I'm in the, edit, I'm in the editorial board, right? Yeah. Am I supposed to say more? I am an advisor. I'm Bob Craig, and I, I guess I'm an advisor because I've been in that brown field for 30 years. Still, Brian, you listening? Uh, I'm an advisor. Um. Kat Moon again, I'm an advisor as well, and a little more context, I practiced for 20 years before I started teaching and represented a number of technology companies, and so I've come to the technology piece both from my practice, um, and I'm now an evangelist for helping lawyers cross the chasm as well. So I've only been doing it for 20 years, but it feels like a millennium. <laughs> well, 20 years in legal tech, internet time is, you know, a millennium. Um, so, um, sound check. Do we have um, David Horrigan, Shauna Hoffman, or anybody else on the line? Can you um, come off mute and yeah. say hello? Okay, I hear Shauna. Hey. Hi, Shauna. You oh, too. You... Yay, welcome. Welcome I... back. Thank you very much. Yes, I've been kind of all over the world over the past month uh, between Taiwan, Spain, and Greece, and it's amazing. Legal tech in general and you know, the ideas of the Ministry of Justice and where they want to move with AI and blockchain is just absolutely fascinating. So I'm excited to join the board. Um, you know, I guess my question for you, Daz, is I don't know. I know advisory board. I don't know if you have any other thoughts for me. I know we've gone in a couple different directions, but um, we do want to talk with you uh, eventually. So let me kind of share who I am for those who don't know. I think I know actually pretty much everyone, um, but I am the head of the Cognitive Legal Pre practice at IBM and we work with AI and blockchain and kind of that convergence with you know law firms, government entities, various uh, different lawyers worldwide. So it's been pretty fascinating over the past uh, seven years since I moved to IBM from practicing in e-discovery for over a decade and uh, the change has just been so much fun and so exciting. 
But I'm excited to take all the things that we've learned worldwide over the past few years and really bring those into play and join this community so that we can actually make some huge strides forward. Because one of the things that I'm seeing is everyone has the same problems. And so if we can get those problems then solved or at least, you know, put out on the forefront saying here's the top 10 issues and here's ways to solve them, then I think we are going to make um, leaps ahead for the attorneys worldwide and really in the end for our citizens. And um, Daz and I are working on, uh, well, and hopefully you all will join us, on um, something with the Future Society and wanting to move forward with working um, in modern day slavery. And we're talking about uh, various different offerings and opportunities to really affect that area and make um, huge insights into bringing to light some of the issues that right now are dark and uncovered. And just to be clear, we're working against human day slavery. Uh, and um, thank you. <laughs> but and, but it, it, truly, it Hopefully is no that laughing. Was clear. It's um, it's no laughing matter. This has become such a such a blight, uh, and we we hear it feels like almost weekly of people in forced labor, and um, well, um, it's in so many difficult um situations, and data can make a difference to uncover um and to rescue these uh these victims and survivors, and to structure things so it's so much harder. Uh, for people to get into that situation in the first place. And Brian Ulyssini, who's been working on this for some years, and Shauna, who's also been a real leader, have kindly agreed to um, co-chair a kind of a task force, is what we're calling it initially, to spin up um, to spin up an initiative in this area. And um, um, uh, Robert has kindly introduced us to people in the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, uh, the Chief Innovation Officer and their Chief Operations Officer, where we're in um, initial, but you know, fairly well along discussions about a potential um, collaboration with them. Uh, part of their beat is also um, human trafficking, and they're very interested in, in um, working on um, what ways to use data to make sure they can marshal their scarce resources better to make more impact. So anyone who's interested in that initiative, um, you know, let us know. And uh, we have a, we'll have a board meeting after this meeting this afternoon where we'll flesh that out a little more but you can find out more at law.mit.edu. So um, thank you, Shauna. We're so delighted thank that you. you're with us. Um, next up, I think we've got um, Sarah Glassmeyer. Are, are you online? Hi, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Sarah Glassmeyer. I am uh, currently with the ABA Center for Innovation, although we're, I don't speak for the ABA. We're very sensitive about that, <laughs> especially in recent uh, days. Um, I am a former academic law librarian and technologist, and my interests really lie in, um, I, I'm on Twitter all the time, and I just tweeted this, because you're know, watching the earlier presentations, you know, it seems like, you know, so much of my career has been trying to introduce technology into the delivery of legal services and how to make it more efficient, but I also am now starting to feel like we really need to remember the humanity involved, and that um, justice it, the delivery of justice isn't a win-loss proposition for some people. Like everyone can win. People just want to feel heard. They want to feel, you know, that's one of the things I learned working a reference desk in Kentucky. Um, you know, people don't need to have like actually to win to feel like they have been made whole. Um, so that's kind of my uh, thing that I will bring to the table is um, hu humans involved in computational law. We should never forget that, that law is a human process. Although so much of it can be automated, so much of it can be um, made into algorithms and, and made more made more efficient. We're here. Thanks, Sarah. And Sarah has been such a shining light in this area for so many years. We're honored to have you on our team. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is uh, is Mila on the line from São Paulo, Brazil? Okay. Um, uh, how about David Horrigan? Oh, okay, we we recently had David Horrigan on the line um, from Relativity, um, and they've also been um, uh, a supporter from the start. Um, you can see our entire um, board of advisors and editors um, at law.mit.edu and on this fancy poster here. A little bit of insight about how this is going to play out. We're going to have uh, authors come up and talk about uh, their submission to the first release of the MIT Computational Law Report for about five minutes. And then we're going to have a chance to get a little bit of feedback from the audience. 
and um, use that feedback as a way to kind of improve the overall quality that we're bringing to this publication and make it more connected between you know, academia, people in the industry, and everybody else who's here um, so that it's uh, as robust as it can be. Here, here. Uh, and do, do we have, perfect. And so um, we're leaning on Sandy really heavily today, uh, but uh, Sandy Pentland is our first author, actually, um, doing um, the anchor article, really laying out the thesis of computational law. Sandy? Okay, so um, I didn't know I was going to do this, but I, fortunately, I already talked about the article, which is this notion of bringing design thinking to legislation and to the practice of law. And I'm told I'm supposed to talk about personal data. Um, yes. Uh, okay, yeah. So, so, so um, I'll give another example. So about 15 years ago, uh, we were building some of the first cell phones before there were cell phones and stuff. And we realized that data off of those phones was going to be a huge issue, both for good and for bad, because you could see, you could track health outcomes, you could do things that were clearly social good, but it also was something that was like 1984 squared, right? And so I started the discussion at, uh, at Davos with an article about uh, people should have ownership rights over their data. And you know, Vivian Redding, who was a member of the, uh, was a justice commissioner for the EU, went on to actually create GDPR and stuff. Um, GDPR gives people the rights for people uh, to know what's being done with their data, but also to have a copy of their data. Okay, and this is a, getting to be a sort of common thing. You see this in HIPAA in this country and things like that. However, having a copy of your data does virtually nothing for you because you have no political power. And a sample of one is not big data. You can't really tell. So recently, we've been developing the software and architecture for setting up cooperatives where the people can, as a collective, own their data and have power with it. So it turns out that credit unions uh, chartered in what uh, the enabling legislation was 1904 or something like that, um, allow, uh, are empowered to manage personal identity, which of course includes digital identity. And they are member owned, uh, not-for-profit organizations, they're community organizations, and um, they have a bunch of interesting structures. Like for instance, they have an alliance among them uh, for investment and political things. They're democratic rather than uh, run by the, uh, the senior people. And so what we're trying to do, and we're just talking to Jonathan here, we, we wanna get an example of a credit union where all of the members take control of, for instance, their medical data. Uh, and just sort of think for a moment what that would mean. What that would mean is, is that I could look at drug interactions so in this country, drug companies don't look at that because of liability. Doctors don't look at it because of HIPAA and because of sort of odd um, economic incentives. Uh, government doesn't have access to the data, not really. Um, so this would be something where you could revolutionize healthcare by just having say 100,000 or 50,000 people in, the, in one city all with copies of their data where they could ask things like, do these two drugs interact? Does this treatment actually works? We don't know these things. We pay 20% of our economy on healthcare. We have no bloody idea how well it works, okay? So what you need to do is put it in the power of people so that they can get a good statistical sample of what's happening and it's in their interest to do that and then we can push back politically. Okay, so there we are, handling data. Yay, okay. Yay. Um, and Ed uh, actually had a question so, to stop before and I told him he could ask now. Okay. Yeah, so that actually, that you basically addressed the question, which is, you know, I know yesterday that was a, a theory of kind of data cooperative that, you know, framework for how that could be shared uh, that you presented and I thought was really interesting. I think in law, that model is, um, uh, can, is a little bit fraught with other barriers, right? Because I think when you talk about healthcare data that's being shared, people have the right to essentially 
submit that into a cooperative voluntarily. Um, but when it comes, and then it's sort of like metadata that's, that's fact based. So, so the credit unions, you're not giving it to the credit union. It's owned the by the union is holding it for right. you. So you have to agree to have it analyzed. But if I say to you, would you like to know how your kids are going to react to a treatment? Would you like to know how, you know, the drugs that you're being given work? The, the reality is, is almost everyone will say yes to that if they're not giving up rights to their data and not exposing their personal data, so which is the case here. I, I think where that finds metaphor in law would be, uh, what are the terms that you're negotiating in these contracts at large? Like what, it, let's say residential leases or something like, you know, what are the terms that are being, you know, uh, that, that you're entering into as, you know, individuals in your residential lease? What are the terms that you're entering into in terms of your um, uh, insurance policies or anything else. I mean, there, there are a number of other sort of, uh, when you talk about how that could be applied in, uh, in, in law, right? And, and I think one of the things that were, was really kind of eye-opening for me yesterday, I forget who said it, one of the speakers was essentially saying the growth of kind of AI discovery is a lot less about AI algorithms and it's a lot more about pointing at a new data. It's, it's almost directly kind of related to access to more data. And legal data, we were just talking about this during the break, is siloed so much, right? The, the, and who owns it and who has access to it, whether it's contract, whether it's anything right. else. You mentioned earlier that like there are examples of like the government having access to huge pools of data because they have visibility into, for instance, tax, right? Because they're kind of stakeholders in that. And then you've got an individual level of contracts that, or you know, other legal obligations that they might be able to share into kind of a data collective, into shared ownership, I should say, in a data collective. But I think I, I'm curious to understand whether there are barriers to that model or that framework that are inherent to things like, you know, other 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 um, forces of confidentiality that might apply to people's legal. So, so just I mean, I don't want to talk too much about it, but but one of the main foci of our research is how do you get insights across siloed data without sharing the data. Because in many cases, there's jurisdictional, but jurisdictional boundaries, there's privacy, there's proprietary things. And it turns out that there are a family of algorithms that allow you to answer collective questions uh, without sharing the data from a legal perspective and without revealing anything that is proprietary or personal. Uh, the classic one is something called secure multi-party computation. We've developed a couple more. There seem to be, once people are focused on it, it turns out that there's a bunch of things you can do where you can answer questions like, you know, is this tax equitable? And this, you were talking about the tax reform. You could answer questions like that with great certainty um, without exposing people's individual expenditure records, right? If, if there was a place that was a uniform place where there was access to everybody's spend or tax records or something like that. And uh, without exposing the individual records, provably not exposing them, and without exposing uh, proprietary things of the data holders, and so like you could go to Intuit, they wouldn't want to reveal some things, but you can do it in a way that doesn't reveal that. So, so that really changes the way you think about data, because if I can answer questions about it without actually holding the data or exposing the data. I mean, it sounds like science fiction, but it works. <laughs> and it's even provable and blah, 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 right? Um, and uh, you, another question that you had was, uh, last year I gave a talk at Eurostat, which is the organization that handles all the European uh, data and data standards. And I heard the commissioner, the EU commissioner, talk about secure multi-party computation. Yes. So this is this is like a, the most senior sort of politician in Europe talking about this very exotic but powerful computer science technique. That's like, you know, joy. Right? <laughs> you know, so people are are getting to the point where they understand that some of the some of the the mechanisms, the computational mechanisms, do things interact with law in ways that are extremely unexpected and you might not believe were possible and so we ought to explore that you're here thanks so much sandy um great well yeah go ahead <laughs> toward the force um elizabeth yeah. uh, 
This is a co-article by Elizabeth and Daza. And it's about a pretty fun concept. <laughs> sure, so I'll start with some. I'll start with some scene setting. Um, so I am trained as a data protection and privacy lawyer. I have a very cross-border experience of practice in the US and the UK and the Middle East. Um, but in the last uh, four years or so, I've been very focused on blockchain and distributed ledger technology. So um, I have been doing a lot of work at the intersection of these two things. Um, and so this sort of content was born out of my experience at the intersection of data protection and blockchain. Um, so Daz and I recognize that um, blockchain and DLT are uh, typically borderless technologies. Um, obviously, we're talking about sort of open networks here, um, but the idea that they don't, re they don't really respect sort of conventional geographic borders um, in sort of public blockchains. This, uh, the idea is that pretty much anyone can stand up a node. Uh, irrespective of where they're physically located, um, which means that it is a real challenge for um, laws which are still very much bound by jurisdiction and geographic scope. Um, so we were thinking about some of the hard problems in reconciling uh, existing data protection privacy laws with these types of um, blockchains and distributed uh, ledgers. And um, there's been a lot of emphasis um, in my view, I guess in both our views, um, on the notion of erasure and the sort of difficulty in implementing um, erasure or the right to be forgotten in the context of blockchain. But there has been very little emphasis on some of the other problems, which in our view are actually a lot more complicated. Um, one of them being how you comply with sort of restrictions on cross-border transfers of data. And so um, our proposal is to design something we call binding network rules, which those of you who are sort of um, trained in data protection or privacy might be familiar with the concept of binding corporate rules which is a mechanism for um, intra-company transfers of data across borders. Um, so some of the really uh, prominent examples of binding corporate rules um, are uh, ones from sort of um, Amex or MasterCard um, or sort of large uh, global tech companies as well, uh, Intuit being one of them. So there are sort of you know, examples in the wild um, and we wanted to see how we could sort of transpose this into the blockchain context. Um, so, uh, some more me you know, sort of meta context there is there are sort of three mechanisms for transferring data across borders um, under uh, regulation like the GDPR, for example. So one is on the basis of um, geography or jurisdiction. So that's something like an adequacy determination. So for example, the EU has determined that a country, uh, for example, Argentina or Japan has sufficient sort of protections in place to allow transfers uh, between those countries. Um, a second one is um, where ours falls, which is this idea of binding corporate rules, which is within the context of a single organization or entity. And a third is something called standard contractual clauses or model clauses, which are um, negotiated, uh, obviously contractually, the name gives it away. Um, and we were thinking, you know, what is the best sort of model for um, something like blockchain? And so where we've landed is that um, the network can effectively be construed as sort of an entity or an organization. Um, and that transfers of data within that network um, or organization are effectively intra-company-like uh, transfers. Obviously, there are issues around whether a, sort of a blockchain network uh, is like a company, and there's some really good um, research we could bring in there from Oliver Goodenough and others um, around sort of distributed organizations, which we will do. Um, but so it's just sort of a mental model for uh, how we apply this type of framework. Um, and then we look at uh, how, you know, how the sort of rules would be designed and how they would be binding and how they would um, sort of implement core principles, um, how liability is allocated and all the rest. So um, that's the sort of background. And Daza, do you want to get into some of the applications? Yep, thank you. Um, and so I, I found this um, epiphany of Elizabeth's that binding corporate rules could be extended to something like a distributed network, like a blockchain. And, and um, composed legally as binding network rules to be very, very provocative and very interesting, and um, potentially to be, uh, you know, it will take some work to, to work out the uh, implementation, but potentially very valuable. And so the conversation that we had that led to the article was um, putting together kind of like peanut butter and chocolate. So if you say that this concept of binding corporate rules applied to distributed networks um, as binding network rules as the chocolate. The peanut butter might be um, an area I used to practice in a lot, which was creating um, overarching rule sets for commercial networks, so supply chains. Uh, it would be called the trading partner agreement um, and the, the umbrella rules. 
uh, or in payment networks. You mentioned um, Amex. So I'm more familiar with Visa, and I, I've done a couple of payment networks with public and private sector partnerships, you know, like EBT. Uh, it would be called the operating rules, would be the umbrella agreement, and then participation agreements for the, you know, like the acquiring bank and the issuing bank and the cardholders, that sort of thing. Um, in identity federations, it's the same thing. When you have single sign-on across a bunch of enterprises, there's some sort of trust framework or some overarching agreement and participation contracts that make those rules enforceable. And uh, so just looking at these design patterns, it seemed like one thing that we could talk about modeling um, and maybe testing a little bit would be <clears throat> structuring these binding network rules against the general this general tried and true design pattern. And there's two, there's two aspects that we thought would be particularly helpful. One of them is that it architecturally breaks things into three layers, and that's good uh, to do things that are um, modular in the way that Sandy was talking about. Um, one layer is that top layer I mentioned, the sort of community rules, one big set of rules that apply to the entire network. So with the visa operating uh, rules, I think that's like a, like a five volume set that deals with a lot of stuff. The second middle layer are the contracts. Those are just a few pages. So anyone that's ever signed like a cardholder agreement or a merchant agreement so that you could process credit cards, no, it's a few pages. And that's the contract that, that makes the overarching rules enforceable. And then there's this very interesting third layer and it's the, the lowest layer of granularity and that I call the transactional layer. So in a supply chain, it would be like um, uh, EDI Edifact, like uh, here's the transaction code for a a quote on uh, for how much I'll sell you a thousand mops and buckets. So here's the invoice code. Here's the acknowledgement code. Um, here's the receipt. Here's you know we we received it at shipping and receiving. Um, it's trend lots of transactions with credit cards. You know it's it's the payment transactions. You're at a point of sale or something like that, and you you push the card through. It's a little bit of data and it's high volume, high velocity. So being able to just think architecturally, break it into these three layers and make sure that the um, that the network and the, the data flow support and reflect that we think is very useful. It's very scalable. The other one is uh, uh, another design concept, which is breaking um, the three key dimensions down so that they're clear and separate and yet um, aligned. And that's um, business, legal, and technical. So like you can remember that as BLT, like a BLT sandwich, you know, it's three layers but greater than the sum of its parts when you eat it because it's so delicious together. So the business part, so you can actually see some examples of this, of this design pattern that uh, um, in my uh, law practice and consulting work, some clients have kindly allowed um, this to be published under Creative Commons. So we'll bring that in, um, in the article as well. But um, basically you've got, um, the way I do it anyway, I've got a business section. So all the basic business rules come right up front, um, you know, kind of, um, basic things like the, the the goals and objectives, some things about the governance, who's in and who's out, business practices, how much, who's who's paying, who's getting the rewards, uh, legal stuff. So that's about eighty percent of the argument over that is liability. But you know, IP, um, order of precedence, like how, where, where does these rules fit compared to other rules and contracts you may have, legal stuff, and then the third part. Most, most delightful perhaps is the technology parts. I mean, where are the standards, where are the, how do you onboard to the system? What kind of monitoring are we doing? Where are the security requirements that we have? And, you know, by having um, kind of a single um, write down of the business terms, the legal terms and the technology terms is an opportunity to use like a unified glossary to let people see across those terms to make sure that there's alignment and harmonization and ultimately integration of the legal part with the business part, really driven by the business part and the technology so that the, 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 the legal dimension and the technology dimension are at all times supporting and reflecting the business deal. A lot of times when, when you lawyer these things, you can come up with you know a beautiful work of art, we think 200 page contract and it just, you know, the engineers and the technologists don't read it. Um, it you know, it's sometimes a lot of the business people don't read it. And even if they did, you know, a week and a month, a quarter, a few years go by and you get this continental drift between the legal stuff, and what's really happening by integrating these things using computational law techniques, um, we can make sure that they remain aligned. And when, as you change some things, you get the appropriate changes in all those sections and you trigger the conversations you have to trigger. 
Um, so some of the things that happen well that were that could be a good fit for um, the concept of binding network rules um, would be uh, in this um, insurance space, which is one of the Creative Commons examples that we'll provide, uh, where they stood up an identity federation to make sure that brokers and agents could sign on once, no matter which insurance provider they were using or which product they were using, you know, whether it's home insurance, auto insurance, you know, life insurance, or so forth. And um, when I helped them write those rules and architect that system, we had business people from all the different providers, you know, the Hartford, Progressive, and others, um, figure out what the the business term should be. We had le legal people from um, from across the organizations, including the vendors and the agents and the brokers, come up with the business the legal terms. And again, most of that conversation was around the hot potato of liability and the technology people from all the organizations setting up like, you know, what are the SAML metadata? How do we connect the endpoints? You know, how do we exchange stuff? How do we migrate from one system to another? So by basically making sure people are on the same page across the organizations participating in the network and that we have this real um, well-oiled and continuous conversation between the business people, the legal people, and the technology people so that the system supports and reflects the understanding is, is the second design pattern that we'll bring to bear. Um, so that's the basic concept of, um, of binding network rules. Um, we've got, um, you know, uh, this is a beta launch, and so we, we need to still think through some of the permutations of that. And we wanted to take the opportunity to talk, tell you about our ideas to hopefully spark some feedback, some questions, and some up and some. Um, maybe some further ideas from, from you all, and you um, may find yourself um, credited and attributed with your content being in our paper. So there you have it, finding network rules. So with that, is there, got time for one quick question, maybe? Anybody? No? All right, Brendan? Yeah. Well, thanks, I got a small comment, <laughs> and it's related to that design. And it was a discussion about this idea of, of policy and how this idea of policy relates to both the higher level goals of an organization and the lower level implementation and the feedback loops you get by looking at a policy and then from that, how that affects the implementation and then how that implementation feeds back up and then that affects the goals of the organization and then that feeds back down and then changes the policy again. So this idea of policy is also a very interesting concept because it spans the entire stack. And I wanna add that because I think that fits in here somewhere. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at sort of binding corporate rules, they're not, um, the idea is that it's sort of this um, self governing mechanism within a single organization or entity. And so effectively it is a collection of policies and the legal bindingness comes from sort of the, the organization's binding itself to its sort of set of policies and therefore transforming them into rules. And yes, there's sort of a, there's a supervisory mechanism where the relevant sort of, you know, regulatory authority has to actually supervise that the, the organization is adhering to its own rules. But um, yeah, I guess that's really, uh, it's an interesting sort of, how does the policy evolve? And this is some of what Dazza was talking about is that what we want to do is not just say, you know, this is sort of uh, analogous to the VCR context, but we want to say, this is how you'd implement it from a technical perspective. So for example, you'd enforce these rules via a smart contract potentially in a DLT or in a, in a blockchain network. So make them actually sort of living uh, rules and policies that are sort of self-executing, if you will. What a world that would be. Um, great, so thank you very much, Elizabeth. Okay, so now we, yeah. So next up, we have um, a great collaborator, um, Sam Harden. Uh, Sam, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through well. Excellent. Isn't it great when these things work? <laughs> um, so who here has heard of Doc Assemble? Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, great. So, you know, a real question that we have here, this being in, in primarily an engineering school and are trying to take an engineering approach to this transformation of law is how exactly do we do it? Like what tools do we use? Um, how, how do you build this? How do you, how do you learn how to build it? Um, so in that spirit, um, we wanted to bring Sam Harden forward um, to 
talk a little bit about his approach. And actually, Brian, can you say how we um, how we talent scouted him and, and basically what people can expect? Sure. So it was last summer and I was in Berlin at the time and I saw Sam tweet out a link to uh, this great tutorial set of videos that he created. And what was interesting about this set of videos is that um, Doc assembles this really great and robust tool for creating expert systems that can interact with different APIs and function very computationally. And, so, and it's all about the law. And, it, and it's all open source. And um, he created one of the biggest challenges that I've had in my experiences with Doc Symbols, getting it set up and configured to different environments. And what Sam did in the very first video was show how you can set up and install this system using Amazon Web Services so that it's functional and interactive straight out of the box. So now you can quickly and easily start deploying these technologies in ways that are, that are very much enabling computational law. And so with that, I'll let Sam get in a little bit to you know, what his vision for this is and how it's going to kind of change the future of what we're doing. And, and, um, and maybe to just outline what, what the three tutorials are that we're gonna be publishing in the first release, if you will, Sam. So uh, Sam, you're on. Hi, everybody. My name is um, Sam Harden. I'm watching you video. I am um, down in Florida. I wasn't able to make it up um, to uh, see everybody in person. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm an attorney. I'm a computer programmer. I'm also a legal technology consultant that works with Measures for Justice, as well as um, a legal research company called VLEX um, and other consulting work on the side. Um, and in Daza, as Daza mentioned, I have been working on instructional videos around a technology called DACA symbol. And I wasn't able to tell who in the audience is familiar with DACA symbol. Um, we had about uh, almost half of the people raise their wow. hand. That's, that's fantastic. Um, you know, I am a DACA symbol convert, um, primarily because, you know, until DACA symbol, there wasn't an open source tool that was easy to use, at least to my knowledge, to let you create these expert systems, to let you create interviews, and to let you really code the law in and hard bake it into something programmatic that you could then turn around and share with others and have clients or have applicants use the program to do certain things, to generate documents, to um, run the logic that you wanted as a programmer and as a lawyer. Um, so I've been creating these tutorial videos to give people who don't have a ton of programming expertise, who don't have a ton of, oh, <laughs> can you still hear me? Okay, if everybody can still hear me, um, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. Um, but as I was saying, I wanted to put power in people's hands to be able to run this kind of expert system and toy with it and modify it and use it in any way they wanted to so that they could do these really cool things and have that power to do these things. Um, you know, in my mind, all of the legal technology tools that I've seen come along are created as scalpels. They do one specific thing. They're, you know, discovery applications or their AI, you know, research applications or thing like that. They're all wall gardens. DACA symbols open source. It's a Swiss army knife in a world of scalpels. And I think that's really kind of incredible as to how it empowers lawyers, legal professionals, and others to create things using something that's open source. Um, so as as I mentioned, the first three videos are about setting up DACA symbol, creating the start of an interview uh, using DACA symbol, and how to bake in some conditional logic using DACA symbol. And if you haven't had a chance to play with DACA symbol, I really encourage you to look it up. Um, there's a ton of examples online. The creator of, John, of DACA symbol, Jonathan Pyle, has done an incredible job of documenting how to use the system that he's created and released out into the wild for anyone to use. Um, you know, so look it up. DACA symbol is incredibly powerful because it lets you run Python 
in addition to creating the interviews and using the variables from the interviews as Python variables to run any number of operations. Um, I've worked on projects where, you know, I use DocAssemble to ingest PDF files, strip the text out of the PDF files and run them through AI algorithms to classify the text using different legal topics. I mean, that's one of the more complex things that you can do with it, but it's really simple to do it using DocAssemble. It's quite amazing. Um, so I wanna thank, thank y'all for having me. I hope you enjoy the videos and um, thank you. Thank you for making them. It made it so much easier um, to, to be able to get the environment set up and to do the first couple of things. Um, one of the things we're using it for, by the way, um, which is in keeping with the theme of our first release, automated legal entities, is um, to do a, a, sh a short interview with people that want to create the LLC uh, is our use case. And we basically elicit from them the key information, the name of the LLC, some things about the operating agreement, uh, some other stuff. And then we're able to um, use DocAssemble to compile that into the correct filings with the Secretary of State uh, to actually, um, and then to receive the uh, information back using some um, little integration we have through the REST API uh, so you can create the entity. And tomorrow, if anyone's interested in hacking on that, we've got some people flying in to, to further that prototype. Um, and then to sort of on a, on a cron job, do the annual filing uh, to be to have listeners for emails if there's notices or things and then we haven't figured this part out yet but ultimately we want to include the dissolution of the llc to kind of wind down the assets and do some of the other stuff that's more complex but the dream is to completely containerize a legal entity what is the user interface for that and, and how do you manage the the document flow and the key events back and forth we we think doc assemble can be a a major part of that and we're using kubernetes and some other technologies as well and you know, we're building some of our own Python, but it's doc assemble in the middle. And uh, we think it, we're testing it right now, but we think it can provide uh, the key components of a solution. Um, what, and part of what we're doing with Sam is taking his videos, which they really do speak for themselves, but so that we can contribute something, we're developing little um, kind of online educational pages so that we're wrapping around the video, um, links to key documents, some checklists and things like that. We've, we've got a complete transcript of everything he said, so you can follow along. Um, and, uh, I'm sorry. Step by step. A step by step guide. Um, so um, before we move uh, to the next um, author, uh, any questions or uh, comments on uh, DocAssemble? Because it's so good. <laughs> okay. So great. Thanks. Thanks again for joining us, and thanks for your tutorials. Thank thanks, you. Sam. Next up, we have um, one of our researchers in the Human Dynamics Lab. Thank you, Daza. So uh, can we apply uh, computational law to legal systems in general and uh, data protection legal regime in particular? Um, well, I, as per the legal tradition, I provide a um, clear and ultimate uh, answer to it, which is it depends. And it depends uh, on um, a lot of things uh, related to the ontology of a legal system. Because we have to deal first with uh, many legal systems, not only the US common law, but we have the uh, UK common law, the civil law system, and so forth. Uh, and then we have to deal uh, with the structure of the legal system that is made up uh, not only uh, of norms, uh, but also of principles of hierarchies uh, between the norms and among the norms and the sources of the law. So who can design the law? Not only the parliament, but either at a local level. So our computational law system must uh, be able to communicate among the legal systems and to embrace uh, all the complexity of uh, um, the ontology of the list, these legal systems. So what I, I do in my contribution is essentially, first uh, I uh, make a comparison of uh, these uh, legal systems, how they work, how the privacy legal regime works uh, differently in the US and in Europe. And uh, I, I want to highlight something that might uh, strike uh, you, but, uh, in Europe, we don't 
own our data. We don't have the property of our data. So uh, just uh, a clue, when you look at the GDPR, don't look at it uh, as uh, we have the property of the data. I said for that, uh, um, I analyze also the um, limitations of the computation, uh, uh, computational law systems nowadays. Why? Because uh, we need for this uh, um, complexity interpretation. So I destructure computational law and uh, the legal reasoning according uh, to the methodology of uh, a legal logic to find common, uh, common ground for both of them. Uh, but still, uh, the interpretation is a limitation. Um, so I then uh, uh, try to uh, address this kind of issue with some provocation. Um, one referred to the limitation of, of a computational law, and uh, um, that, that deals essentially also with semantics, because the norm is not just uh, um, some word in a, some order with a fixed meaning, but uh, it, it, uh, it is composed um, in, in its proposition and precepts with uh, several uh, meanings that can overlap depending on the situation. So uh, what I propose uh, is uh, to think about uh, legal systems uh, and especially civil law systems uh, as uh, um, a sort of uh, uh, quantum mechanics realm because I found uh, many analogies uh, which I believe are even ontological uh, relationship uh, between uh, quantum mechanics and law uh, and essentially what I state is that uh, if uh, there's uh, such analogy, we might uh, exploit uh, the same uh, uh, laws of uh, quantum mechanics and the same uh, um, approach to measure uh, the phenomenon with the law. Uh, and uh, with this approach, we might be able to, um, to understand several phenomena or to predict them in a probabilistic way I give you an example, uh, um, the outcome of a jury, because a jury is composed by humans, and humans behave, uh, behave according to several patterns. Uh, but they must stick within the framework of the law. Um, and I give you an example of what I mean by uh, the connection between uh, quantum realm and, uh, for instance, data protection. There's an effect in uh, privacy that is called the chilling effect, in which uh, uh, if, you, um, if you are the data subject and you are monitored constantly, you change your behavior. So if we drive uh, 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 along the street and we have the police car behind us, we behave differently. And this is exactly the, uh, the how the observer interact with the uh, observation, with the object of the observation. Um, last step, I finally connect uh, some other dot and uh, I try to connect uh, social physics uh, with all these uh, arguments. Why? Because social physics has, uh, uh, I believe, uh, in common with the law, one uh, special characteristics. The norm, this precept, uh, tend to uh, or wants to modify the human collective behavior and so does uh, social physics. So I try to describe uh, how it can be used in, in this uh, kind of system. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Great. <laughs> so we, we had said it's not a deep academic journal, but we do make exceptions. That this is, you'll see soon this article is actually very substantive. And one, one of the parts that I am particularly happy about is the, the term setting. So, you know, these law in general, society in general is so cross jurisdictional, so cross boundary, so global now that just the term setting between civil law jurisdictions and common law jurisdictions and some of the basic dynamics and design patterns for international transactions is is one of the strongest um, contributions in this article. Then the application to computational methods in a privacy context where data is flowing is such a great use case. And then these very MIT, I'd say, were the um, observations about <clears throat> analogous potential ways to look at it like as physics um, at quantum level and at other levels as well. 
um, I really think um, brought it all together. So let me answer, are there any um, comments or uh, questions on, on, on that? Uh, Diana. Uh. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering if you're using Eisenberg principle because it seems so and transposing back to law. And the second question is, is most related, there's a lot of people working in philo usually philosophy and natural language processing on signifiers and so on. One of the problems is when we have a bunch of, I don't know, court decisions, the meanings change across time, but the signifiers are the same. So the temporal networks analysis actually is a tool that we have been using lately, because even Roman law, for instance, is the same and today is the same, but for instance, a woman is not property, but in the, and the kids. So I just, kind of the input is this to the ideas if you're looking to temporal networks analysis names in natural language processing and the second one if you have the inspiration of Eisenberg principle because it seems so uh, well I start from the second uh, yes and no so uh, I didn't have an inspiration from that I did have uh, the inspiration from the chilling uh, effect I described and then I, I started to think with the, this kind of of a quantum mechanics paradigm um, um, with a bottom-up uh, approach. And I did find many analogies with the, what I call the legal entanglement, uh, the quantum legal leap and so on. It, it can be described in the law as well. Um, so to, to answer the first question, uh, um, essentially, yes, natural language processing is part of my analysis, also because I, I didn't uh, mention it to sum up everything in a nutshell, but I address also the role of speech interfaces uh, as uh, the future primary tool of interaction between the users uh, uh, or the professional users and a computational law system embedded in it. So that's absolutely part of the deal because uh, the um, all sticks with the uh, interpretation of the words in the correct meaning in that correct situation. So do we have time for one more? Brendan. Fascinating. Under civil law, if one doesn't own their data, what do they own? Have you some hour to discuss it? <laughs> well, <laughs> so it's a short question, long answer. In, in a nutshell, Sandy, in a nutshell. Um, Sandy Pentland. We have licensable uh, uh, personality rights on it, but uh, they are limited uh, by the non-availability of some rights like dignity, freedom, uh, body disposition, and so on. So, um, my understanding of it, at least the genesis of it is, is uh, that uh, in Europe you have ownership rights, but not ownership. So, ownership rights are rights to have a copy of it, to understand the disp to understand and control the disposition of the data, um, uh, essentially, right? And so, it it um, the, this way of thinking comes from English common law, right? And uh, I believe, I mean, what people tell me is that that's the, the rights that you have. So you don't actually own it, in part because it's co-created. So like, for instance, cell phone data. Well, you wouldn't have that data unless somebody invested billions of dollars to put up cell phones and provide you that service, okay? So, so there's some, some argument about co-ownership there. And it's a question of, of what are the rights on the two sides? At least that's my understanding. As I said, I'm not a lawyer. I, yep. <laughs> no, well, uh, in the US, it's, uh, it's uh, technically right for my knowledge to speak about uh, ownership of the data because uh, in the US, uh, data protection deals uh, with the uh, proprietary paradigm. Um, which entails several legal effects. Uh, in Europe, is, uh, it's uh, reverted. So we can uh, uh, dispose of our data. We can uh, decide how to, to give them. Uh, but uh, the data are protected by others' principle. It's true that on the same kind of data, um, of the same data, can, uh, there can be uh, some plurisubjective ride. Uh, so we don't 
to uh, speak about uh, co-ownership, but plural subjective rights, which means, for example, my DNA is not only mine, but provides information of, of my parents too. So it's a pluri subjective data. Um, the information inferred by my metadata and by a data controller is uh, my data because uh, it's related to me. And so given the GDPR definition is um, a data on which I have rights, but they have rights too. And uh, typically, uh, intellectual property rights. So there's uh, a conflict uh, and that's why I claim we will always need uh, an interpretation uh, because uh, law is also about uh, conflicts among uh, rights, uh, principles, uh, interests, uh, and so on. So, Thank you so much. <laughs> Great. And so we promised you um, complex, digital, automated, autonomous organizations. And John Clippinger is going to deliver on that. Um, put, put this into context. It's really great to be here for this, uh, the formation of this journal. Um, 15 years ago, I was at the Berkman Center Report as the Berkman Klein Center. And uh, we set up something called the Law Lab. We did uh, Wilson Sincini's term sheet, made it in, put in list programs and tied it into uh, in cap tables and provided genetic, genetic algorithms to evolving contract laws. So, so see things happening. And, and then that was sort of a, an odd thing to do. Um, but I'd, I'd like to build on Sandy's point that um, there is a new way of thinking about firms and a new way of thinking about capital and finance that has to reflect our time. And so they talk about what I call generative firms and generative capital. They sort of go together. And, and the, the belief is we really have to invent new forms of organization that can deal with the challenge of our times. Um, and one of my interests, one of the things I did, uh, I've done, uh, I'm currently with the City Science Group. I used to be the Sandys Group. And before that, I always said I was with Berkman. It started a number of companies. They also set up something called the Token Commons Foundation in Switzerland. Um, where we were concerned about climate change and how to create a way of, of recording and sort of generating certificates that you could trade RECs. And people talk about climate change, but that's sort of an intransitive verb, it's sort of a passive way of talking about it. In fact, we are actively killing the planet in front of the climate, and, and that's a harsh way of putting it, but we have a short period of time in which to make a transition from a static infrastructure to a dynamic infrastructure. So a lot of things we're talking about decentralization and it's happening AI-driven systems, there's something is absolutely a necessity in order to meet these challenges. And so we also have the inequity challenges that are out there. Um, and this is in revolts happening around the world. We're seeing the systemic changes. We're seeing a change just as you went from feudalism to market-based economies. We're moving out of market-based economies. We're reorganizing ourselves in very fundamental ways with very strong consequences. And Part of that, in my belief, is that we've got to design things that are not against nature, but of nature, that reflect natural principles and biologics and how they organize themselves. And actually, it's much more, it's more, much more adequate, it's much more sophisticated system designs and the mechanical designs that we've lifted from basically the 17th century. Um, trickle down doesn't work. So we really have to, I think that's a recognition. That we have our whole, our, our structure of, of how we organize our society and look at how we invest capital, you say, okay, we, we make a mess of things, but then we'll set up a, 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 a nonprofit and we'll, we'll re have some mechanism of redistribution. But the argument here is that we really have to build things that, that are designed to make these changes. And so the carbon caps don't work. Um, I don't know if having a life of its own. And so the, what I would argue is a need to have be an end to extractive capitalism that the idea of a third party makes an investment and take the money out of the system and then it accrues to a special group. And that capital dominates the whole allocation of resources in order to maximize returns for a small group. That is a fundamental principle that creates externalities. It doesn't work. That's why we're in the crisis that we have both with the climate and our social inequities. Part of this is rethinking sort of the, what uh, universal human rights are. There's a notion of positive rights and that was, they're different than how the US constitution is done. And actually working with South Africa, they have a very advanced constitution where they talk about positive rights. So people have, an ob have a right to housing, they have a right to healthcare and it's the obligation of the government to do that. And the government can be sued if it doesn't do that. 
So this is organized around outcomes. It's not just a process. You're designing systems to achieve certain outcomes and you evaluate the system in terms of how well it achieves that outcome. Part of the work that we've done sort of with the city science group is to create these analyses that collect data and look at cities and say, okay, what outcomes do you want for a city or a community or a district? And that could be, and how do we change the performance in terms of the city, the whole collective interaction of different kinds of asset types, different components of the city to change positive outcomes. And that part of the positive outcome would be sustainability, be, be equity to eliminate pollution. So there's a, there's a whole design process here to say, okay, these are the outcomes we want. What are the processes? What are the mechanisms that effectively achieve that? So we, this concept of generative design, uh, Neil Gershenfeld is in the Fab Lab did a book on design, generative design of reality. There's a lot of work that's being done on uh, an auto desk that have generative design where you start with a set of outcomes and then you generate lots of different variants of that and you have a, like a fitness function that selects for certain attributes. Um, and this is how nature does it. So can we, if we take some of those concepts and apply them to the design of different kinds of firms, different kinds of organizational structures. And our focus has been on zero carbon, resilience, affordability, and equity. So we're, we're looking at cities or uh, area, it doesn't have to be a whole city, it could be a district, it even could be smaller than that. How do we create affordable housing? And how does that trade off against other kinds of requirements? Because you also want to have things that are sustainable. You want, so you have this balancing act between different kinds of challenges and how do you create the proper set of incentives? Uh, part of my background has been also in the whole area of tokenomics and, and token design. So I've been advising a lot of different companies on how to design tokens. And so what I call micro-monetary policy, I want to create the incentives to do this. So you have a biologic design to generate, explore asset combinations and realize a reduction in costs. So you, how, do you, how, how do you really build that into the system? You make an organism basically that's designed to achieve these kind of outcomes. One of the things that, that it's important to notice is that when you look at different, there are the 22 different sectors that are represented here. Um, this is done by Blackstone, BlackRock, uh, the, big, the big hedge fund. And basically what you're seeing is that most sectors, when they get, they become exponential growth and become highly deflationary. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of value that's generated in reducing the cost of something, the coordination costs, in or that should be captured. And a lot of times it's not captured by the current mechanisms. And that, that's one of the things that we wanna do. The other thing we wanna do is be able to create an asset class that is actually what I call a strange attractor. It's a attractor for investment that's negatively correlated with the current fossil, a fossil economy. So if you wanna draw, you have a short period of time, you wanna direct money into a particular, a new infrastructure, this is the big challenge. How do you do that? How do you create the financial incentives to do that? You start to see what's happening in fossil economies with, the, the, with what they call stranded assets of oil and fossil, because now it's cheaper to produce energy through solar than in more fossil economies. So there, it's starting to transition. But when you start to price in the full cost of the climate and the insurance cost, you see what happens in California and you say, well, no, no, actually, how do we factor that? That's gonna be a challenge to banks and so that we believe that that's gonna create a, a demand for a new set of asset classes. So this is part of the general thinking. Um, so the idea is a new firm, a charter, a new kind of charter. I mean, the, the, when we think of a firm and a corporation, we think of it, you know, it's designed for how to, how to aggregate capital, how to you know, reduce liability uh, and how to distribute benefits to people who are willing to put risk capital in. That's often it would happen in tripping, uh, shipping and trade. Um, but in this case, we want to do something else. And this is what the article is about, what I call a reflexive mutual series LLC. And reflexive in the sense that what you, rather than extracting capital out to goes to a third party investor, you bring it back in. You're able to pay, you can pay off that capital, but bring it back in and build up the equity within the network. So it's a mutual organization. Vanguard is an excellent example. It's a six and a half trillion dollar successful mutual organization that's able to reduce costs and benefit its members. It's a series, there's something called a Delaware series corporation that allows you to create sort of replicas of the same thing. So you wanna create something that's viral that can replicate itself uh, and maintain a certain set of principles and be interoperable. So that's another design consideration we have. 
And part of this is, is sort of the reverse engineering of traditional capital structure. I say uh, one of the things I've been involved in, 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 in designing tokens and utility tokens, security tokens, and how do you have the regulations that surround that? It's, it's still very murky right now. But if you look at the capital structure and how different kinds of assets are described, you can you we sort of reverse engineer, their, engineer those, not to the benefit of the third party, the outside investor, but to the mutual organization itself. So we actually have a uh, we have a, a platform which we're doing this. It was designed for compliance and regulation of security tokens, but you can turn it on its head and have a different set of permissions around that. Yep. Which one? There's another one in there. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, so part of this idea is is, is to to mimic uh, biology and and basically what I call sort of metabolic capitalism or, or uh, catalytic capitalism. And so there's work that's done in complexity sciences about applying ideas that are used what they call autocatalytic sets, that things in combination create gener greater value than isolation. So that's a, what we think is that you don't look at just one asset class, you can look at say at housing, you, housing and combined with mobility, combined with 5G, in to together create greater value than when seen by themselves. So the, the uh, somehow this is uh, not cooperating here. Um, but the, the, the end game here is, is be able to uh, create sort of local currencies that reinforce the value proposition of the particular mutual organization. So that's, that's the, in essence, the, 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 the concept. We're implementing it. There's a project in, in South Africa in Cape Town that has property that we're gonna explore this idea of how do you how do you achieve positive rights to this kind of organizational structure and capital structure? Wow. <laughs> okay, John, okay. John Clevenger. <laughs> Wait, not so fast. I, I would keep, keep holding, holding that. that. Um, any questions or feedback on, on that one? Reflexive, adaptive, really mutual, born, serious organization, digital. right? <clears throat> okay, so, oh, well, here's a hand. Um, Brian Ulysses. Can you just say a little bit more about the Cape Town project? It sounds. Yeah, uh, what, there's a developer in Cape Town is also an investment company that has bought a number of, of um, properties there. And in, 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 in he's, his view is that you have a post-colonial society that has huge inequities. And so they want to do is be able to, for someone who's paying the rent, and paying very, basically paying rent, paying for their energy, paying certain uh, utility bills or whatever, be able to achieve ownership over a period of time and then build up an asset class. Basically, they, they can pay off their obligation to the, the financer of, of the, the development, but themselves take ownership and create a new kind of, it's almost like a, a commons. It's, it's like a, an, a reserve asset that they own, that they can use that to invest in other properties, other assets. Um, so this, this individual is, is he wants to, he has a property of about a thousand, I think, uh, um, uh, apartments, but the, there's a whole set of settlements they want to look at this way as well. Uh, and the idea of there in their constitution, they have a concept of positive rights. And the point is the positive rights, is, as I said earlier, you can sue the government for not doing this. So can you design the system in a sense, to deliver against those 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 uh, those positive rights and hold it accountable. So it's a new it's a new governance mechanism. It's a new legal framework, and you we're using the blockchain and all that kind of stuff to create certain transparency. Uh, but it it's it, to the point. It, it rapidly evolves. It's an iterative system. It's not a fixed system. It learns. It gets feedback. And then it keeps changing itself. Um, and and your obligation or your your accountability is to the outcomes. Uh, Brendan Marr. John, that hits the, uh, the nail on the head. <laughs> really tremendous, tremendous stuff. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment, and it's that, uh, yes, this is all around the rubric of a circular economy, but what's really interesting here is to put a slightly different spin on it. Uh, essentially, the notion that you are your own currency, you're, you are your own coin, right? Think about that, right? Paying, paying into the own, your own system. 
generating your own asset or whatever you need and then paying back into it changes the dynamics of everything. Yeah, just, just to add to that, one, one of the slides didn't come through. I don't know what happened, but there, there's, a, there's a whole idea of being able to create digital twins. There's a, a group called Versus that allows you to, um, it's very, it's, it's amazing stuff, be, be able to, through machine learning, recognize objects and give those objects, uh, they'll have wallets and identities and they have permissions and they have spatial contracts that govern them. So you have this digital overlay in which you can sort of then have your governance uh, uh, and you can govern different kinds of physical activities around that. So that, and it also has with it a DID, decentralized identity within it. So you're collecting data, you're doing a governance mechanism, but you're not violating the privacy. So it's a very, it's a, it's, it's a very powerful technique. Okay, here, here. Thank you, John. One more. <clears throat> so we're working hard to engineer, you know, the mechanics of, of, of completely digital organizations. And then as we get better at that, it raises the question, and what would you do with them in a digital economy? Here, that's one vision. Um, so next up, we have a professor of law, um, Colin Starger, um, who's written another, um, it's a very interesting crossover article between something that's, that could easily be published in a, in a traditional law review, and yet also is very much not only data driven in its um, in its observations, but also has data directly embedded in it. Um, and so it's exactly the shape of the of the type of um, publication that that we seek. Um, and his points of view are also very provocative. So, uh, Colin, if you could introduce yourself and and um, and give us a flash talk on your article. Great. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Daza, and thank you, Brian, for organizing this. I'm sorry, folks, that I can't be in the room with you, although um, uh, this is quite an interesting experience to see my giant face up <laughs> in the room um, some miles away. I'm a uh, law professor at the University of Baltimore, and as Daza said, in very many ways, I'm just a traditional law professor. I write academic articles. But I've also have a strong interest in social justice and, uh, and a technology background. And my idea for this article was to write something that I was calling a mobile native, or we can otherwise think of it as a responsive law review article, based on an original data set uh, that itself would be open for further analysis. And substantively, the article arises out of my work in the trenches of Maryland's pretrial justice system. So for three years, I ran the pretrial justice clinic here at the University of Baltimore. And that worked with our state public defender, the Office of the Public Defender, to challenge cases in which indigent defendants had uh, not achieved pretrial release. They'd been detained prior to their trial. And we would uh, argue the students working in a law firm um, uh, which is the clinical model in many law schools across the country use it, uh, would attempt to get those folks out making specific arguments under Maryland law using a vehicle known as habeas, was essentially a bail appeal. Uh, but based on that work, I saw a lot of alarming things and I realized that there was a need for an academic treatment. And the descriptive thesis of my argument um, is that the, uh, the presumption of innocence is dead in the pretrial context and that we should be very alarmed about this. Uh, and the data that support my conclusion come from a massive database of scraped Maryland court records. And I analyze this data to look at a phenomenon of what's known as nolle prosecute or null pros, or simply the dropping of charges. So it's a Latin term, null pros, uh, is, which is recorded when the prosecutor opts rather than to proceed with charges that were brought after an arrest or after an indictment uh, to drop them. And the reason why uh, this is troubling, uh, the phenomenon itself isn't troubling at all, but the, the context in which this is troubling is the pretrial context. And what happens just by way of background for those of you that don't know, if you are arrested and charged with a crime, very quickly you will go before uh, a judge and that judge will determine whether or not you are going to be released prior to your trial date or detained 
prior to your trial date. Many people are familiar with the uh, bail. You pay a little bit of money, uh, and then if you return, you get your money back. Many people have heard about how unfair that is to poor people, uh, unaffordable bails, and there's a lot of motion around the country, a lot of litigation that's been going on challenging that. Uh, but there's also a category of um, uh, held without bail. So basically you can be held without bail, you can be released on a bail, which you may or may not make, or you can be uh, released. And the problem is, is that many, many people are detained prior to trial, and just to be clear, prior to trial, under the eyes of the law, you are presumed innocent. They're detained either because they're unable to make a bail or because the judge determines that the charges against them are so serious and their background is so bad that we're not gonna risk letting them out. And then after 30 days, a month, two months, three months, all of the charges are dropped and they're released from jail, having served all of that time for absolutely no point. And they're not uh, reimbursed for that in any way. Their lives are hugely disrupted. The lives of people around them that depend on them are hugely disrupted. And it's all for naught. The presumption of innocence that they were always sort of wrapped in uh, proved to be true because the charges were dropped. Now we saw this anecdotally in our practice a lot and our practice began to look at how uh, widespread the problem was when we were formulating the challenges. But from the uh, academic perspective, from the perspective that I was wrapping into this article, I focused uh, my research on the four largest counties in Maryland from the years 2013 through 2017 inclusive. So that's five years and 167,000 cases that went moved through the district courts. And you should know that in 60% of those cases, 60% of the 167,000 cases, every single one of the charges was null prost. So the cases were dismissed in their entirety. And for a subset of about 12,000 people, 12,000 people over five years, not only were all of their charges dropped, but they were in jail the entire time while their charges were pending. Uh, the total was 1,486 years of what I call unnecessary incarceration. That was the, the total shared between those 12,000 people, approximately 12,000 people. On average, they served 46 days before they were released with all of those charges dropped. Uh, and the median was about 39 days. So that's a serious uh, disruption. Uh, there's every reason to believe, or so I argue, that the problem is not isolated to Maryland. Uh, and the article kind of explains why this is the case, and there's plenty of visualizations. So I should say that I undertook, you know, something unusual for a law professor, I suppose, is that I undertook this analysis using a SQL database, which I then imported into Python and rolled into a Flask app and did all these little things that, um, uh, uh, with the idea of it being a, a mobile native law review article. But with that sort of techie angle to it put to the side, the second part of the article is more classic normative scholarship. Uh, and I argue why this outcome of having so many people incarcerated pretrial really for no reason and defying what the presumption of innocence should mean uh, can be blamed on a case called Bell v. Wolfish. So hence the title of the article, The Argument That Cries Wolfish. And without getting into the doctrine too much, essentially there was dicta in that Supreme Court case that suggested that the presumption of innocence did not apply pretrial. And it suggested that the presumption of innocence was merely a way of allocating the trial burden, uh, the prosecutor's burden to prove every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, for a number of reasons, I argue that was wrong to begin with uh, and is wrong now, not the least of which was that that was decided in the era before plea bargaining uh, pretty much defined what happens uh, in terms of trial outcomes and uh, in which a trial was much more frequent. It was before the era of mass incarceration and it was before this era that we're seeing of these mass null process. So, uh, uh, that's the gist of the article. I'm super excited that this is going to be part of the MIT's Computational Law Report. And uh, I hope that it makes a, a contribution that can help bring some traditional law review type scholarship in with this extremely innovative form that uh, Brian and Daz are pioneering. So thank you. Excellent, thank you. 
Yeah, so justice, you know, can it be quantified? Well, um, here's one way it, it can be, or perhaps injustice is what we're really quantifying here. And did you hear that part about the you know, over 100,000 cases that he was able to wrangle ultimately into SQL and then refactor into Python? And those flask gaps he talked about are part of how we're going to be, how we are producing um, this uh, media. So you'll be able to see the data and sort of in, explore the data a little bit embedded right within uh, within the articles. Yep, and then we're also going to be staging the data as well in a public-facing GitHub repository after um, the article comes out so that people can explore it and figure out you know, deeper insights, deeper meanings, and we can use this as kind of like a springboard into a more advanced dialogue about what the data can do to compute the law so that it's more fair to everybody, so. Um, so uh, any, uh, so one question I have, uh, I'm going to use my imaginary gavel. Um, could, would there be any objection here to our um, extending uh, the adjournment from 12 p.m. to say 12, 10 p.m.? You, you, and you'd be, okay, I wasn't sure what that. Okay, so hearing no objection by unanimous consent, we will adjourn at uh, 12, 10. Um, and are, is there any uh, questions or feedback for Colin while we have him? Um, how much does everybody love what Colin's doing? <laughs> a lot. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, thank you so much, Colin, for, for your work and for joining us for the inaugural issue. Thank you. Right. Um, and so next up, uh, our last um, author, we have a lot more content. You could read all about it here. But uh, the next author, the last author we have to talk about uh, the um, most recent accepted uh, content is Professor Jonathan Askin. Thanks, Daz. And I promise I'll be very quick, especially since we heard Daz speak this morning of uh, peanut butter and uh, chocolate combining in his BLT analogies to legal tech. Uh, uh, in, in any case, I, I got to tell you, I've been an academic for 12 years, and I've mostly been shiftlessly, shiftlessly waiting for a publication like this. I hate the vortex, the black hole that is legal academic scholarship. Uh, I think it's a monumental waste of our time and energy and it gets read by three subject matter experts and then it dies in the vortex. The fact that something like this now exists is sort of a dream come true for me. I've got, I, I can't tell you how many ideas are percolating in my head about things I wanna write specifically for this publication and not for any of the other uh, legal uh, journals out there. Uh, the fact that we have this opportunity to cross-pollinate with technologists, with business people, with scientists, with policymakers is the scenario I envisioned when I started teaching and thought that it, this would be the kind of stuff I should and could be writing. Uh, in fact, two years ago, uh, uh, Daza and I and some others were instrumental in launching the Computational Law and Blockchain Festival. And out of that grew Stanford's Computational Law and Blockchain Journal which I thought was gonna be something more like this, but frankly, it is another one of the legal academic journals that is designed and geared mostly for legal academics. Uh, I love the fact that this is reiterative, that this allows for multimedia capabilities, most of which are beyond my abilities, but certainly not among the abilities of the rest of the folks in the room. So well, the first piece we were thinking about doing, so I, my students and I have been brainstorming to figure out what, how we can contribute effectively. We, uh, in fact, my students and I were the legal counsel to establish the computational uh, law report. And we had fiddled with all sorts of newfangled DAOs and Vermont uh, BBLLCs and platform cooperative mechanisms. We sort of overthought everything and decided at this point, let's put a stake in the ground and make sure that there is a structure today for the MIT Computational Law Journal. So we're a simple Massachusetts LLC. I mean, I'm somewhat embarrassed to say, but at least it's a placeholder structure to allow Daz and Brian to take in proceeds and get the thing launching with some liability protection at least. Uh, uh, so we thought the first interesting piece for us to write for the first issue would essentially be a short piece on using legal automation tools to set up a computational law report. So it's sort of a meta self-reflexive piece on the processes we went through and the tools we've experimented with. And frankly, 12 years of learning by uh, uh, my part on how to engage students to become 
digital attorneys and to what extent do you allow them to use automation tools? Do you allow them to get behind paywalls? Do you allow them to uh, experiment with new corporate structures for innovative clients? Uh, so so our, our piece is gonna be sort of our thinking and rationale as we help uh, these folks as uh, legal support for uh, this innovative sort of journal. Uh, it might be a little bit uh, sort of lighthearted and tongue in cheek, but the goal is to have something there for the first issue on the processes of automating a journal such as this. Indeed, uh, thanks Jonathan. And thanks for helping us set up the LLC. Um, this is, um, thanks. Okay. Uh, this is in line with um, part of the podcast series that we're doing in addition to the substantive podcast with Harvard's Case Law Access Project and with others and the, the media with Sam Harden. <clears throat> we're also taking a page out of the book of Gimlet Media and we're doing a kind of a, like how I built this like two or three podcasts of just how the how this publication came apart uh, came uh, upon us and and uh, and how we're structuring it differently. So we hope to feature Jonathan's article as part of that. And um, incidentally, he actually used a tool. We tried a few different tools, but the the final one we tried, I think it, it came out of the global legal, uh, did it come out of the thing with legal tech lab, something that we collaborated on a few years ago. And, you know, they elicited, you know, like not many, it was like 15 or 20 questions from us. And then just, just propounded this like 30 page, like really tight operating agreement for a Massachusetts LLC. So uh, there's a lot of good learning in here. Okay, uh, what's next? I, oh, I forgot. Up next, we have the uh, look ahead. So this is where we look ahead to what's gonna be coming in the future beyond release one. Um, and so we're going to be doing a lot more advisory editorial board and peer review outreach. Um, we're gonna be doing a lot of supporting organization outreach. So if you know of any organizations that you know, would be interested in stuff like this, we would love to work with them. Um, we have the piece that uh, Shauna had talked about earlier in the introductions that's being co-led with uh, Cool Brian, Brian Ulysny, um, where we're trying to figure out computational law solutions to some of these modern day slavery issues. And then we also have a pesky issue about getting an ISSN number. Right. Um, all that more. So all of our data is going to have a, a it's DOI yep. uh, to, with the ISSN. So it'll actually, the data sets as well as the articles and the applications will all show up <clears throat> in ways that actually make sense for citation and then uh, within uh, law reviews and publishing. Uh, and so in this way, we can actually begin to cite to data science um, in, an, in an appropriate way that, that you could include in a blue book um, cited um, law review article, or for that matter, um, filings with a court, uh, or just for your academic uh, enjoyment. Yep. And then moving on beyond that, uh, for our second release, which is going to be first half of 2020, we're talking about this idea of opening up information, standardizing that information, and figuring out how to derive more utility from the information. So it exists more than just something like a paper might, for example. We want to really focus on this transition from not just digital, but to from paper to computational. And I think uh, this will be a really fun theme. We've already got a few people in the pipeline who are interested in submitting content. And if you would be interested in submitting under this theme, we'd be very excited to work with you and uh, solicit as many things that you have to create and in as many forms as you have the brain power to create. Indeed. Uh, could, could you pull up the pub pub site? So we can close oh yeah. It? Great. So, um, so th this idea uh, for a computational law report actually did start um, a couple of years ago with a brainstorm that Jonathan mentioned <clears throat> with legal hackers, our favorite group, civic hacking group, uh, it's, it's part of the uh, inaugural um, computational Law and Blockchain Festival, which is now in its third year. Um, one of the, we, we had an idea of growing three publications from that. One at Stanford focused on blockchain law and policy, one here at MIT focused on computational law, and uh, one at um, uh, Berkeley at Bolt uh, that was going to be more privacy focused. Um, so we talked about that. Stanford, um, they're so good at startups at Stanford. Uh, they, they actually got it up and running and they're about a year ahead of us. They've been very helpful with us um, in um, advising us uh, from their um, experiences and helping us get up and running. We hope to bring uh, Bolt um, uh, up and running next. One of the things we're doing also, I should say, is we're trying to collaborate across these newfangled 
um, publications, these media publications on um, in um, in um, in a new in-cut way of using a, a common tag set. So um, there's already two or three issues of the uh, Stanford Law uh, Journal of Blockchain Law and Policy. Um, we're, we'll have our first one um, released in in early December, as Brian said, and we, we've had conversations with the editors of the Crypto Economic Systems Journal here in DCI. Digital Currency Initiatives publication, Stanford and ours, so that we'll be, we have basically a common, we have like a, a collaborative uh, document where we're making sure the keywords and the tags for articles, we're just using the same super set of tags. Um, and we're working with um, our platform, which is called PubPub. It's an open source uh, publishing tool where we're publishing all of our, um, all of our publications. Uh, it's sort of like Medium, but you know, even more featureful for this uh, deeper type of publication um, to uh, enable it so that for our, like, I guess they call it federated or uh, uh, journals that when you click on one of those tags, all of the articles across our journals that are tagged with that, with that term will show up. Um, so we, we hope that this will be one of the ways that we can break down those barriers and, and help to facilitate and catalyze idea flow. Um, so we promised also a beta launch. Um, this is not public yet because we do want to get a round of edits, but can you, if you yeah, so click on one of these, the, we in fact have the now current drafts of all of the content online. You can't see it in the public view, but if you log in with Brian's ID or my ID, you can actually see all the content. So ta-da, we're not lying. It's really here. Yep. And let me get to one of the videos because those are probably on the more functional side, but uh, PubHub, one of the nice things about it is that it allows for iframe. Um, so we can just plop the YouTube videos in there. We can plop the Flask apps in there so that we can actually get more utility than you would be able to out of just something that's stuck in paper. Um, and so that's really exciting to us. Indeed. And so while the idea for this started a couple of years ago, you know, um, uh, the, 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 at that point, the computational law team at MIT was pretty small. I was the only um, main person and there was a few other um, sort of visitors. Um, what happened that was different was in our annual computational law course um, this past year, um, uh, Brian Ulysny and, um, and uh, many other people, TMA, and uh, Brian Wilson, uh, Camila, um, the, Brendan and many other people that aren't here, we got together and we're talking about it. We, we just said to ourselves, well, why don't we just do it? Like, let's just make it almost like a class project and we rapid prototype something on PubPub. Um, I guess, thank God, none of that content from that two hour jam session has survived, uh, but it did take a page out of this legal hacking book and the MIT hacker ethic of let's do something quick that and iterate it over time. And I, I just wanna um, really underscore the, the primary role that Sandy had by providing leadership and space and some resources um, and partners like Thomson Reuters Lab and Cool Brian uh, and others around the world who, who, came, who came forward to, um, to um, give us good ideas and to, and to make things like coffee available. Uh, and most especially Brian Wilson, uh, who um, basically has paused his previously scheduled life in Kansas City uh, and, and moved to Boston and, and, uh, and who's done the lion's share of the work putting all of this together. So um, I, if we can just, if you'd please join me in taking a moment to recognize and thanks Brian Wilson. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I'd also like to take a moment to thank Daza as well. Um, without uh, getting connected with him four or five, six years ago now, I, there's no way that I would be here. And I don't think there's any way that something like this would be even possible. So let's give Daza a round of applause for enabling this idea. And, Enabler in chief, ask and, my family. And, uh, and with that, um, I, I've pulled up one of the pub pub pages that we haven't made public yet. Um, it's a lot of pubs in one sentence. Oh yeah. But uh, no, so we're, we're going to be having the 2020 IAP computational law course this January. I think the dates that we've settled on are the 7th, 8th, and 9th. Yep. And we will, be, uh, we will be posting a sign up form so that if you want to access that virtually, um, you will be able to. Um, so one of the things that we like about the course is it's also digital first so that everybody from around the world can be involved so that their voices can be heard and so that we can collaborate with people in places like Hong Kong and you know all these different parts of the world. 
Portugal, Diana, who's also in our in our course and has been a, a major help all around the world. And uh, let me see, I think that's... And so if you, you wanna know how to sign up and find out more, um, law.mit.edu. And uh, for the launch in December, we'll be pointing law.mit.edu to, to this beautiful PubPub site. Um, and so I wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, thank you for the support. Thank you for making this possible. So let's engineer the law. Let's hack the law together. Thanks. We're here.